through the boldness given the apostles by the Holy Spirit, the church is growing very dramatically and rapidly, and Satan is not at all pleased. He seeks his various devices to stop this movement, to stop the spread of the honour and glory of the Lord Jesus, to stop people getting forgiven and turning away from his service to the service of Christ. He had influenced the high priest and the council to have Jesus arrested and executed, not understanding the scriptures that declared that this would happen, but that Jesus would rise from the dead. Now the Holy Spirit has come on the apostles, and with great power they bear testimony to the resurrection of Jesus by many signs and wonders. And so thousands of people are joining and learning the ways of Jesus. How can Satan resist this? Some of those who believe are still under his influence, and he influenced Ananias and Sapphira to pretend that they were giving more than they were. But the Lord revealed their deception and took away the life of Ananias and Sapphira. It wasn't the apostles that condemned them. The apostles just revealed what it was that God was condemning in them. Satan's next attack was to arrest the apostles because they'd already been told not to teach any more in the name of Jesus by the authorities, but they had continued to do so. And the authorities were feeling a little bit insecure because it was their council that had executed Jesus. And the apostles were plainly saying that this was the action of the chief priest with his council. They had arrested the apostles and put them in prison, planning to bring them before the council. But an angel of the Lord let the apostles out of prison during the night and sent them back into the temple. And the people were listening to them. Nevertheless, they stood before the council and defended their actions. They must obey God rather than men. And Gamaliel, a Pharisee on the council, had defended them by saying, be careful what you're doing, because God does act. The Pharisees believed in resurrection, so they allowed that Jesus might have risen from the dead and that these men may have been sent by God. And he quoted a little bit of history. Theudas, a rebel leader, had 400 men following him, but when he was killed, his movement died. And then there was Judas of Galilee, who 30 years earlier had gained a large following, but when he was killed, his movement died. If this movement of the Christians was of God, they would not be able to defeat it. But if it was of men, it would die and they needn't worry anyway. So they accepted Gamaliel's advice. They beat the apostles and threatened them and told them not to teach any more in the name of Jesus. But they let them go, and they continued to teach in the temple, right before the chief priest and his crew. Satan then, as the numbers grow, continues to resist the church. Now in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the apostles multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me 
as we share together these verses from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. The church is multiplying, and so the management structure that you need for a small group of people becomes unwieldy with a larger group. And particularly what is happening is that the church is being built together with people of different backgrounds. You have Hebrew-speaking Jews becoming followers of Christ and the Greek-speaking. While they were all Jews, they had different backgrounds. There tended to be an attitude of the Hebrew-speaking Jews that they were superior from the Greek-speaking Jews because they were of Hebrew culture, not of Greek culture. And the issue really was that there were many widows, there were many poor people that were being supported by the church but there was a sense in which the Hebrews were being favoured in this and the widows among the Hellenists were not being looked after properly. The apostles realised that this is not something that they should get distracted by. Their commission is to teach the word of God, but it is a matter that needs addressing. And so they challenge the believers to seek out from among yourselves seven men of good reputation. It is the community that nominates these representatives and seven men are named and in fact it seems that they are all from the Greek speaking community so that they are looking after the interests of the Greek speaking widows. But there are spiritual requirements required of these people that they are men of good reputation that they are people who are known to be reliable, that they are people who are full of the Holy Spirit, that they have demonstrated by the manner of their lives their willingness to declare the gospel, for the Holy Spirit gives us boldness to speak the message, but also their wisdom in the manner in which they've done it and the manner in which they've lived their lives, so that the apostles might appoint these seven men who would form a team but they will also have the confidence of the community, not to do the work themselves, but to oversee the way things were done, so that things, as Paul would later say, are done decently and in order. And we find that the focus of the apostles' ministry would continue to be prayer and the ministry of the word. Many people who go into full-time service today as ministers of the gospel end up having their time taken up serving tables. These practical ministries are very important and there are people who should be doing these things. But the ministry of the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God, is the fundamental responsibility of the church and that needs always to be before us. The believers were happy with this solution. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and six others, Philip being the next name. And Luke is going to tell us about the ministry of Stephen and Philip. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and Philip, a long-term evangelist. So even these seven didn't just wait on tables. Some suspect that Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, becomes the source of the group called the Nicolaitans, that are referred to in the book of Revelation, although I don't think that's established. But these people are appointed to the ministry. They are brought before the apostles. The apostles pray for them and formally appoint them by laying their hands on them. And Luke summarises progress to this point by saying, the word of God spread. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The first stronghold that resisted the gospel were the chief priests and the priests. But now many of the priests believed in the Lord Jesus. The church in Jerusalem is established both with the teaching ministry of the apostles and by the caring ministry of the body of Christ and become the people of God. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbour as yourself.